A deadly shooting results in criminal charges for two Clear Creek deputies, including one deputy who didn't appear to be on the scene when that shooting took place. After two months of secrecy, an investigation into an RTD derailment in Aurora is unsealed. A Denver nonprofit wants to give LGBTQ teens the confidence to take the stage despite renewed criticism from conservatives. A drag's been stigmatized so much to be this one thing, but it's a performance art. Local educators team up with Colorado's correctional facilities to give inmates a second chance in the classroom. And soccer fans kick off our favorite Friday tradition with a friendly wager. My good news is I'm going to make a donation to Nine News if England loses. We've got good news depending on who you root for. All of it is next. It was headline news when people tend to turn off the TV to spend times with their families for Thanksgiving. So we'll tell you again. A grand jury indicted the Clear Creek County deputy who shot and killed a man in a mental health crisis who'd called 911 for help. Andrew Buin is charged with second degree murder. Another Clear Creek deputy, Kyle Gould, was also charged with criminally negligent homicide. He wasn't on the, team, on the scene at the time of that shooting. A closer look at the body camera hints at why he's also on the hook. We're going to warn you, this video might be tough to watch. Step out of the car. The indictment charging Clear Creek Sheriff's deputies Andrew Buin and Kyle Gould with the death of Christian Glass is sealed, so we only know the charges, not the details. Buin's charges are pretty well explained by the body camera video we've seen of Christian's death. He's charged with second degree murder, reckless endangerment, and official misconduct. When Christian refuses to get out of his car, Buin is the deputy on tape who breaks a window, shoots him with beanbag rounds, tases him, and then eventually shoots and kills him. No injuries. Kyle Gould wasn't yeah, on scene when that shooting happened. Uh, Gould is charged with criminally negligent homicide and reckless endangerment in the indictment. He arrives after the shooting to question the officers on scene. But if you rewind the tape, you get a hint of why he's facing those charges. Are you on live stream right now? Yeah. Okay. From early on during the call, Buin and his partner are on the radio with a supervisor. They ask for permission to break Christian's window to get him out. Gould's already given us authorization. We're just oh, trying everything on, we can to. Double check. I'll send 5116. You have the best pop in this window. That decision ultimately led to the shooting and an indictment months later. Both Buin and Gould have been relieved of their positions with the sheriff's office. A couple of legal experts I talked to today say it's pretty rare for an off site officer to be charged in a case like this. Both of them have bonded out. They're due back in court next month. The RTD light rail train that derailed at an intersection in Aurora two months ago was traveling almost four times the speed limit, according to newly declassified reports. RTD opened an investigation after a September 21st derailment at the intersection of Sable and Exposition sent three people to the hospital. That report has been kept confidential, even from Aurora City leaders, until earlier this week when some of the documents were declassified. According to that report, the light rail operator was driving 38.8 miles an hour, going into a 10 mile per hour curve. It's the exact same speed that caused another derailment at that same spot back in 2019 that left one woman with a severed leg. Service on that part of the line has been suspended since September. It's rescheduled to resume next week, but now operators will have to stop before going through that intersection. The speed limit on approach will also drop from 35 to 25 miles an hour. A report about how Colorado is recycling essentially says that you're doing some good work, but you can hold the applause for now. The state has a long way to go. Anusha Roy has a look at the cost of not recycling properly and adds up to tens of millions of dollars, but there are solutions in the works. There's one line in this study from the group's EcoCycle and Colorado Public Interest Research Group that sums up where we stand. Colorado is poised to jump from being laggard to becoming a leader in recycling. The state's recycling and composting rate is 16 percent, half of the national average and short of the 28 percent goal for last year. A big problem is the lack of access and it's simply not easy enough. Less than a third of people living here have guaranteed access to recycling. That number keeps dropping for people living in apartments 
and in rural areas. And many times people have to opt into curbside recycling and pay more for those services. The study shows every year things that could have been recycled end up in landfills. Things that could have been sold for more than $100 million. It includes jars, bottles, cans and boxes. The same things businesses have been struggling to find because of supply chain issues. One thing we've heard from experts over and over again is highlight the good too so it's not so overwhelming. So, even with Colorado's low recycling rate, by diverting just over a million tons of materials from landfills last year, the state saved greenhouse gases at the equivalent of removing 430,000 cars from the road. The study authors are thinking about the impact if more is done. They would like to see less plastic use, more access to composting, and are encouraged by what multiple cities are doing, including giving composting cards to folks at no extra cost in some places, setting up a pay as you throw trash policy and applauding cities that are providing recycling to everyone. For Next, I'm Anusha Roy. There are two pieces of legislation repeatedly mentioned in that study too. One supports businesses using recycling materials to make new products and another is expanding recycling services to fill the, in those gaps including in apartments and rural areas. It will also educate people on what can and can't be recycled because that can get confusing. It's been nearly one week since a deadly shooting killed five people at Club Q, a safe haven for members of the LGBTQ community. In the wake of that tragedy, some LGBTQ organizations around Colorado have been thrust into the spotlight. Hateful comments popped up in far right circles just hours after the shooting, especially targeting drag performers. One Denver nonprofit says it won't be discouraged and they are doubling down on efforts to create safe spaces for LGBTQ teens. Dragutante is a Dragutante, excuse me, is a nonprofit that pairs kids and teens with drag mentors and helps prepare them for an annual all ages drag performance. Founder Robin Fulton started that program five years ago when her own child expressed an interest in drag performance. She created Dragutante as the way to bring kids like minded or like minded kids and parents together. Fulton and her son James, Jameson, who now performs under the name Ophelia Peaches, says it's all about helping parents and children come to terms with queer identities. And they plan to continue even through the criticism. Kids are watching. If we sit down and if we're quiet and we stay home and we cancel our programs, that doesn't teach them anything. It doesn't teach them that we as their parents, as their mentors, as their community are going to protect them and that we believe in them. It's a place where I feel like I can call it my home and my chosen family. I've made friends where I don't even talk about drag with them, but I have I've connected with them. And to have a community of people who I identify with is important. Bolton says the board ensures a safe and respectful environment by working closely with parents and background checking all participants. The next performance will take place next summer in partnership with other LGBTQ focused nonprofits like One Colorado, and the Matthew Shepard Foundation. You guys are coming through big time with your word of thanks contributions this week. Your donations are going to the Colorado Healing Fund to support those impacted by the Club Q tragedy. Here's Kyle with an update. Thank you for your support of the Club Q victims, families and survivors and the broader community impacted by that shooting. Club Q has asked that donations be made to the Colorado Healing Fund and you have delivered more than $100,000 donated through this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. Scan the QR code on your screen if you'd like to join me and others in donating. The Colorado Healing Fund is working with a few different LGBTQ nonprofits to make sure that the community's needs are met both short term and long term. The Healing Fund has already moved out donations to pay for expenses like memorial services, medical costs, and travel expenses for families. Thank you for being there for our neighbors again and again. Colorado's inmates find a second chance in the classroom. Can't change what we did, uh, but we can change who we are. While local university believes an investment in their education benefits offenders both in prison and on the outside. And even when the rivalries divide us, positivity brings us together. We head to the World Cup watch parties in search of something to smile about. Next. Some prisoners are spending their time behind bars differently these days. They're planning and preparing for what their life looks like when they're released. They turn to a local university for help. Anusha Roy gives us a look at the Inside Out program. Sure. 
Other questions about exam items in particular? This day's lesson was about psychology. Um, I was curious about number 64. A class that's much more than just tests and coursework. It's a place for students to understand and change their own behavior. Some of my friends, when they come over to my room, they notice that my books are like stacked and organized and my bed's made and they're like, oh, you have OCD. Jason Bondurant is a part of Regis University's Inside Out program, where he's working towards 18 college credits transferable anywhere. I graduated high school in 1997. Um, was not a good student, uh, barely graduated, um, so, you know, thinking about college was never really on my mind. But then everything changed. I've been incarcerated for a little over 17 years. I've been on this path of rehabilitation, really just trying to hold myself accountable for what I've done. His inmate number is 138844. He will never use his education in the outside world because he's serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole for murder. He takes classes at the Colorado Territorial Correctional Facility in Canyon City over Zoom. Yes, Territorial, go ahead. While Professor Roberta Mancuso teaches from Regis University in Denver. The pairing is really important, right? The pairing of the relaxation technique with the exposure to the stimulus. We can't change what we did, uh, but we can change who we are. It's what teachers, I think, live for, you know, changing people's lives. I hope to be a source of inspiration and um, also a resource for people to use who are trying to do this same kind of thing for themselves who will be getting out of prison. People like Rebecca Romero, who says this program fits where she is in life, in a halfway home, getting ready to transition back to her family. My children were 10 and 12 when I went to prison. She started her coursework behind bars while serving time at Denver Women's Correctional Facility for drinking and driving and vehicular assault. Luckily, I did not kill anybody, but I did affect a lot of lives negatively. Now she's working towards her bachelor's and hopes one day a master's, learning to make her wrongs right. My end goal is to help other women that have been in my situations, that have overcome addiction and rape and abusive relationships and being torn away from everything they've loved. The program is designed to reduce recidivism, which is tied to achieving higher education. It's also designed to inspire other inmates to spend their time differently behind bars. Yeah, I'm going to give it a shot. And change their path if released. What's great is that you just described exactly what it's like for a lot of people. And while the success of the program is unknown, Professor Moncuso yep. sees a difference inside the prisons and students. They're looking at their world completely differently from week to week. There's a, a much larger community of people here who want to change than I think is held in the common perception of this population. So the first cohort will be graduating next month. So there isn't a lot of data yet on how well the program is working, but we were told that there are three people who started this program while behind bars and are still working on their education after they were released. At this point, Steve, we are told that none of those students have reoffended. Yeah, and we've heard over and over how important this is, but I imagine it's got to get a little expensive. Yeah, so the program right now is costing around $200,000 a year to run, and Regis is covering those costs, but they're definitely applying for grants and funding to help out with that cost in the future. Imagine, it gives people hope yeah. that there's something on the other side. Anusha Roy, thank you. Well, we had a nice afternoon out there. Those temperatures were pretty decent for the day after Thanksgiving. 53 degrees right now, where it actually feels like 53 degrees, and that's because we have winds coming in from the south at just six miles per hour. As we take a look at our HD Doppel radar, we're right under clear sky, so not a whole lot to look at tonight and even as we go into tomorrow. But that is scheduled to change. We have some light snowfall that'll push in late Saturday into Sunday, but shouldn't affect your Sunday plans. Nothing that'll really be sticking to the ground there. In the meantime, we're clear and calm tonight. Those overnight lows near 29 degrees, so pretty mild. But take a look at the seven day forecast. There's a lot of change in store. So tomorrow, another mild to warm day. Highs in the upper 50s. Late Saturday into Sundays, where we're going to see some overnight to early morning snowfall, but it'll all melt. We're not expecting any high accumulations, just a quick dusting. Sunday, we stay in the lower 50s. Then Monday,
Monday, that's where a bigger change is coming in. Midday Monday, we're going to see a strong front push through. That's going to bring breezy conditions, cloud cover, and more snow, more measurable snow sun, uh, Monday into Tuesday as those temperatures drop, pack, maxing out in the lower 30s for our Tuesday. Win, lose, or draw. These football fans all have something to smile about. So the good news today is that like this brings the whole country together. We put the rivalries aside and let the good news take front and center. Next. been a long week. Let's leave you on a high note. 326 Fridays later, we've still got good news to share. Our Tom Cole hit McGregor Square, where World Cup watch parties had everyone in pretty good spirits. I'm in here. I'm in here. Here, 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 here. My good news is that we're in the World Cup. We're playing England on Black Friday. We play Iran in the final group stage game. So the atmosphere is fantastic because we haven't been in a World Cup since 2014. My good news is I retired from Marriott for 25 years of great service. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. My good news is I'm not at school today and I'm watching the World Cup with my bros. The good news today is that like this brings the whole country together. I may be from England, but everyone's really friendly and it's just a good time. I've been here for a year and a half. I've met the best American people. But those friendships won't hold for the next two hours because the good news is, it's coming home. I got a good news today. Uh, England's going to lose to USA. Uh, my good news is, I'm going to make a donation to Nine News if England loses. My good news is, the US is doing pretty good in the World Cup. I know I'm going to leave this bar super happy, um, and I'll try to console all the American fans around. My good news that our family is happy and healthy and we're gonna have a great year. My good news is a four-day weekend. My good news is I just had a soccer tournament in New Mexico. So for us to be in the World Cup, the whole city comes together, the whole country comes together, and the fandom's just extraordinary. My good news is that I got to spend uh, watching the U.S. soccer game with uh, a lot of friends. Great day. Good news. Do you have any good news? I wish I had. The good news is that we tied though, so we are not yet disqualified. I guess it is what it is. But yeah, hey, let's go England. God bless the Queen. So much for that guy's donation to Nine News. While soccer fans gathered for watch parties, others took in the sun and the sights at Colorado State Parks. Entrance to all state parks was free today for Fresh Air Friday. The good news for fans of the outdoors, Colorado is setting up a one-stop shop to get your park passes next year. For 29 bucks, you can buy a parks pass whenever you renew your vehicle registration. Tonight's next question comes to us from a viewer named John. He wants to know whether his family should stick to their tradition of buying a park pass each Christmas or whether they'll automatically get a pass for all of their registered vehicles. John, this all depends on how many passes you need and when you plan to renew your registration. Starting next year, all new Colorado vehicle registrations will include a $29 fee for a state parks pass. So you won't get the pass until you renew your registration and the pass will be linked to your specific license and registration info so you can't share it between other vehicles in your household. The $29 fee is cheaper than traditional passes, but you can still purchase a regular pass if you want. Uh, and to save a trip to the DMV this time around. A snowy ride is the most Colorado thing we saw today, and it's next. A one-man Iditarod is the most Colorado thing we saw today. Jennifer Burns sent us this photo of a two-dog sled team getting some work in in the Colorado snow. Send your most Colorado things to us next at 9news.com. We'll see you next time.